All right, folks, welcome back to our podcast, the Normans versus Mongols. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at the Norman training and uh, on their side, and we're going to be looking at the Mongol training on their side. Now, both sides start off at a very early age. Uh, for the Mongols, their warfare training was a way of life. For the Normans, they trained to make warfare their life. So uh, very similar to the way they trained. So first, looking at the Normans. And the Norman side trained to begin at a very early age, as I stated before. It began at the young age of seven, similar to the Spartan Agoge. Uh, another similarity it bared to the Spartan Agoge was that it was extremely dangerous. Uh, one account said that uh, out of seven boys who went to go train to become Norman warriors, only five of them made it into adulthood, one being killed when they were training in wrestling, and his head was smashed against a rock. Another one was killed by a wayward javelin. Now, uh, to me, that sounded a little suspicious, more like a uh, murder covered up as a training accident, but, you know... Tough world to live in in uh, 11th century Normandy. Uh, the Mongols began their training also at a very early age. Uh, they would uh, train in horsemanship. No, cut that. We're going to go back to the Normans. The Normans would be trained in the use of the lance, uh, how to shoot the bow, riding on horseback. They were trained in hunting to help them practice military maneuvers. Uh, one of the exercises they did with the uh, lance, their famous couch lance they use, when they charged the battlefield, was that they had to uh, train to hit a uh, target, you know, shaped like a shield. And um, it was stated that they were so good at this, but that by the time they had completed their training, uh, their trainer could put a uh, something, a, a penny the size of a dime, you know, they had shillings at that time, uh, the size of a dime on it, anywhere on that board, and they'd be able to pierce it with the tip of their lance. And I find that very believable. I mean, if you've been training to do this since you were seven years old, uh, by the time you're 22, you know, you're going to be pretty good at it. That's uh, 15 years of hardcore training. Uh, the Normans were also separated into units of 50. So uh, one Norman knight, and this is, this is average, of course. Sometimes they could probably only have 30 men. I know that when uh, Robert Giscard, son of Tancred, one of the ones we're going to be talking a lot about in the future, when he showed up to uh, Normandy, his troop of men was only 30. So, you know, it, it could vary, it could be 30, it could be 20, it could be 50, but usually the idea, the ideal group of, uh, the ideal group of men in a unit for a Norman army is 50 men with one commander. Now, uh, separating men into units is very effective as far as communication goes, because, you know, if, if you're talking to an army of 2,000 men, it's going to be kind of hard for all 2,000 of them to hear you clearly and to hear your battle plans and hear when to move and when to stay back and when to attack and so on and so on. But if you talk to just 20 men, because they're separating units of 50, well, 20 men who are experienced and been doing it for a very long time, understand how to take orders, understand how to give orders and obey, and they each know their own units because they grew up with most of them, that communication is going to be much more clear. It may go through steps, but the communication is going to be clear and efficient. And this is one of the things that I think made the Norman army very effective. Other professional armies were trained as a, you know, as a whole. They would... Uh, they would have one commander over, you know, 2,000 men or 5,000 men. And yes, communication was probably still good there, but also, remember, the Normans grew up with most of the people they trained with. They fought most people they trained with in training for a very long time. It was this very strong uh, brotherhood, brother, brotherly bond they had with the men when they fought. And the, their ideals, their ideas and goals were extremely similar. And yes, they fought amongst themselves frequently, but when they fought an enemy, they would, they would wreak havoc and terror upon them. You know, the... Byzantine Empire, Emperor, Empire was terrified of the Normans and what they were going to do. The Lombards were terrified of them. Everybody. So they were effective fighting force. Now, uh, as far as training goes, I wanted to point this out because a lot of people overlook it when they discuss the Normans. Normans could fight on foot. They could fight on foot. They were a very good infantry force. They did train primarily to fight on horseback, but it wasn't like if you got a Norman off his horse, which would not be an easy thing to do. But if you did get him in that position where he wasn't on his horse, it wasn't like he couldn't fight. When uh, William the Conqueror took England, he had large amounts of infantry in his force that were all Normans. They were Normans. So it wasn't like that they had absolutely no experience fighting as foot soldiers. They were very effective infantry, just as effective as they were as cavalry. Uh, the other thing Normans would learn for cunning tactics would be patience. They would, uh, excuse me, most of their commanders would not, even though they were eager for a fight, they wouldn't rush into battle. Uh, per se. They would not uh, put themselves in a bad position. They would look at the lay of the land. They would, when they, when they built their fortifications, when they conquered areas, they would pick cap, They would pick areas that were natural fortifications themselves. Um, 
you know, it was like a hill that overlooked a vast plain or the highest peak of a valley, an area that was far away from uh, rain, so when it rained, it didn't flood the area. All those things were taken into consideration, and they were trained in this, uh, again, from a very young age. Warfare was instilled in them. And as far as training as a unit goes, the tournament was something that the Normans did engage in. And a lot of people uh, often dispute oh, as to whether or not the tournament was effective in uh, making you a good fighter. And I'm going to go, like I often do when I discuss, if you guys have seen my video on the, uh, the, uh, the Testudo formation that the uh, Vikings didn't know how to make. Didn't know how to make. Um, common sense would come into play, I'd say yes. Uh, yes, it was also dangerous, like I mentioned before, you know, you could get killed during this training, but, you know, that, that is a part of, that's a fear of warfare. Also, um, seeing your comrades die at a young age, like, you know, that boy who died having his head smashed against the rock was probably only 10 or 11 years old at the time. Seeing death like that at a very young age during training where you're supposed to come away from it alive is going to build a different type of uh, resilience in that person. So their, their mind becomes a very powerful weapon. And this is something that is extremely important to understand when you're in a big war. Discipline is one of the factors that's going to come into play and help you succeed. Now, we're putting the Normans against the Mongols in a potential what-if scenario, and discipline is going to come up. When the Mongols fought people, communication, speed, and uh, discipline were often issues that led to defeats that could have easily been victories. I know when um, Genghis Khan's sons invaded the Polish, invaded the Poles, the Poles actually came very close to defeating that Mongol army. It, it, it was easy, but a lack of discipline led to defeat. I believe with the Polish king, he uh, after he defeated a small contingent of the Mongol cavalry, well, not small, but a small compared to the entire size of the Mongol army, he pulled his troops back and there was a bridge that was there that the Mongols could cross easily. Uh, his commanders were like, well, burn the bridge down and post your sentries in case the, the Mongols come back. And he was like, well, we don't have to worry about that. We just beat them. So he's partying, and the Mongols crept across the bridge, just like his men warned, and uh, attacked the camp, which had no sentries, like his men said to post, and wiped them out. So I don't see that happening going against the Normans, especially since we're putting this fam pitting this family against family. It's the Tancred family against uh, Genghis Khan and his sons. And uh, I, I don't see that happening because Norman, it, it was, it, Norman discipline was not only good, it was, uh, it, it was spectacular. Also, like I said, there, um, it wasn't like they had this moment where they would say, okay, we won this battle, let's just, you know, chill and do nothing. They're, they're, they, were, they were adventurous in their spirit and outgoing. They were always looking for the next, the next big challenge, the next big conquest. When Robert Gascard showed up in Norman, showed up in Sicily, he had thirty men. When he died, he was at the head of something like uh, thirty thousand men or forty thousand. Size varies on it. Um, that he had with him, and yeah, that's what it was: thirty thousand men with him, and fifteen thousand more men he had in reserve in another part. So uh, it wasn't about you know we won one, one and done. They were expected to do. They were expecting to do more. And also, like I said, the strategic positioning they would put at their castles. And also, castles were not all stone. They also built wooden castles as well because they were easier to put up. Uh, a big disadvantage to a wooden castle is it burns very easily. Uh, and that's a tactic that the Normans did indeed use. Uh, and I know everybody out there who loves history, we love to bite on flaming arrows. Yes, they are astute. They are foolish to use against a stone castle. But uh, like I said, there were a lot of wooden castles in Sicily. And flaming arrows were pretty effective against wooden castles. And yes, there are accounts of the Normans using flaming arrows to uh, burn down uh, some wooden castles when they were in Sicily. But like I said, this is against a castle made of wood. It's not against a stone castle, and it's not on a open battlefield. This is during a siege where it makes sense to put it to good use. Now, if you look, uh, if you look at the uh, Mongol side of training, it began again at a very early age. For the uh, Mongol warriors, when Genghis Khan was alive, when they served in the battlefield, they were expected to serve from their youth, you know, being when they, when they be, first became a man, around 14 years old, into 60. So, 46 years of uh, warfare. Excuse me, at least. And 60 was the age that you retired at from fighting. So, very long time and uh, very good soldiers. 
Uh, their primary weapon, of course, would be the recurve bow, which is extremely famous. And yes, it is not a long, it's not a straight bow. It is the recurve bow that holds the world's record for the uh, longest bow shot, the longest bow shot. Now, the the thing about the Mongols and the Normans, why I love find them both very interesting, is the question people often ask is what made them so special? What made the Normans so special in the uh, West when so many other armies were there that had been around longer and bigger and had done great things with the similar equipment. And what made the Mongols so special with the recurve bow on their horseback? You know, you had the Huns, you had the Avars, you had the Scythians, you had the Muslim horse warriors, you had the Mamluks. Um, you know, what made the Mongols stand out from all them and what made the Normans stand out from the um, armies of the West? And I think a big difference that made them stand out was their attitude towards warfare for both sides. As I stated before, the Normans were eager for battle. They did not show up on a battlefield looking to negotiate most of the time. When they showed up on a battlefield, they showed up to crush the enemy on that field. The Mongols also had a similar attitude. It was conquest. It wasn't invade, threaten, and get something out of it. It was invade, destroy, indoctrinate, take over, take what good things the enemy had, add them to our arsenal of weapons that we already have that are extremely effective, and expand. And this is something that the Mongols did very well, similar to the Romans. When the Romans lost to a certain weapon on the battlefield or a certain tactic, they would take it, examine it, use it to their advantage the next time they fought their enemy. Uh, when the Mongols defeated somebody who used a good tactic against them or a good weapon, they would take it, examine it, and use it again against their enemy. So, this is again, looking at the attitude, I know I said we're going to talk about training here, but this is this is part of it also because this is what's being indoctrinated into you as you, as you uh, fight and as you go throughout your life, you know. It's not just the leaders who are, who are having these thoughts when they go into the battlefield. The soldier himself has his own ideas and his own ideals when he goes out there. So, it's the, like I said, it's the attitude that both sides had was for conquest and expansion. It wasn't. It was a very different from the way others looked at it. Also, the way they fought, um, and the speed with which the, the, the Mongols moved. Now, also one thing I wanted to point out was that the Mongol horses were actually small and sturdy little animals. They would uh, take five horses to a man, which is how they were able to move with extremely fast speed. And throughout this podcast, we're going to discuss armor because armor is going to change. It is going to evolve. Uh, from Genghis Khan's time, obviously, it was not. Um, the most expensive armor because when he first became, when he first had his own small band of warriors that gathered around him, he couldn't afford the armor that he had when he died, uh, in, in, in vast amounts anyway, because, well, he wasn't the great Khan yet. Uh, so weapons are going to change from, you know, the, the, uh, leather lamellar with the silk shirts underneath it to, uh, steel lamellar, and it's going to go from beyond just a breastplate and cuirass, extending down to the thighs, so on and so on as it goes through each uh, Mongol warlord within the time frame that we're discussing for this what-if scenario. So, hunting is where you would build your uh, maneuvering with one another for the Mongols. Uh, you learn to move when you chase your hunt and your prey, and this is the kind of training you're going to be getting. You're using the same bow you're using to hunt your animals you're going to use for warfare. So, it was a very easy transition from everyday life to fighting for the nomadic warrior of the steppe because all he was doing was changing the target really you know he hunts with his bow every day of his life well now i'm hunting on the battlefield the only difference is i'm shooting at a man who's my enemy instead of a deer or a rabbit or a fox or whatever i'm hunting and they also trained to use the lance as well and the sword now in the early days of genghis khan's time you know when he's still timogen before he's genghis khan the great khan um not all of the soldiers would be well, um, would be, uh, not well, but, um, adapt at using the sword and the lance as much. Because, again, these things were still expensive. You know, it costs money to make a sword. It costs money to make a spear. So, and the bow was something that they made by hand themselves. And the materials to get a bow are actually easier to acquire than the materials to make a sword. As well as the process. You know, you need the bellows. You need the uh, fire pit. You need the forge. You need to know how to temper and so on and so on. There's a lot of things that go into it, and that's uh, logistics, and that's going to come up later on again. But, you know, your, your, your lasso, or your staff with a uh, rope on the end of it, a weapon the Mongols did use to capture enemies alive, um, 
a non-lethal weapon, basically your ancient taser. <laughs> um, something that Mongols, like I said, something that Mongols could use to capture enemy alive. Uh, was also th those tools will be much more common when uh, Timogen is Timogen at the time. Uh, the sword and the the lance, those weapons, less so common among the you know more so common soldier. Sorry, I said that twice. Less less common among the common soldier. So uh, the difference in training would um, would be actually very little if you think about it. The Normans would hunt to help them maneuver. The Mongols would hunt, and this would also help them train their maneuvers as units. Uh, they both, both sides did indeed wrestle, both sides wrestled. Uh, the thing that was much more common for the Normans was, the, uh, sorry, for the Mongols, where they trusted the bow to pick their enemy off. You know, they wanted to rush by him, hit him with the arrow, wheel out, and come back again. Uh, the, norm, the idea was to win using your primary weapon, which was the bow. The Norman approach to warfare was to patient, if you look at the majority of the battles, under the side of Tancred especially, was to patiently wait for the right moment for their most effective weapon, being that cavalry charge, to smash into the enemy and annihilate him. And they even developed, the reason they had the kite shield instead of the round shield on horseback was because it was developed specifically for this charge. The uh, kite shield covered the upper part of the body with its curve, and it extended down to that narrower point to cover the leg of the Norman as he's charging onto the battlefield. And another another way that they were able to tell who the Normans were when they first showed up was because it was said that their chainmail shirts were exclusively um, came down beyond the knees. Um, most chainmail shirts were stopped around the waist area, but because the Normans fall on horseback, you want to protect your thighs, and that's why their that's why their shirts extended down to there. Uh, so it was specifically designed, like I said. Their way of warfare, even though they could use the sword, even though they could fight on foot, even though they also had men who had bows, even though they also used the axe, and even though at this time they still had men who actually had round shields as well for their foot soldiers, the the, the power, the great X factor was that cavalry charge that they had. And if you have a great, if you have that super weapon, you want to base your tactics and your approach to warfare around using that super weapon. And this is specifically, again, on the battlefield. The cavalry charge is not something the Normans tried throwing at a castle when they came to it. Okay, leave that to, you know, nonsense in movies. It, it's, you don't want to rush into a stone fortress and smash your best weapon, your best army against it. First of all, you don't want to risk them being crushed. Because if that happens, everyone's like, well, there goes the super weapon that everyone feared. Now what? So that's one reason you wouldn't do something stupid like that. The other thing is, uh, it's very unlikely for it to ever work. You know, you're not going to get a bunch of guys and just smash through a stone wall. It's just not going to work. Uh, you would use siege towers for that. And yes, the Norman Sons of Tancred did use siege towers. And they also used ballista. You know, a lot of people have, a lot of people are questioning, uh, did they still use ballista by this point? I'm like, yes, they still use ballista. Uh, remember, the Roman manuscripts that we get translated with ballista on them, I think people often forget they came from somewhere before we got them. So yes, the uh, Sons of Tancred knew about Ballista, and they used them effectively. Now, back to the Mongols. Now, for warfare, Mongols received training in their everyday life, the, in the hunt. The uh, big hunt that the Mongols would go on was called the Nurge. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. I'm sorry for anybody out there who is Mongolian. That's not my intention. I'm just trying to learn. If anybody can help me pronounce the uh, names of the separate commands in the Mongol, uh, please leave a description below, especially if you're Mongolian. I know I could probably just look it up, but I like hearing from somebody who uh, actually knows what they're talking about, so help me out here. But the Nurge. It was the uh, big hunt that the Mongols would go on uh, before the winter season came, and they would gather up all the meat that they could. And what they would do is they would get all the people, all the men on the horseback, to encircle a large group of animals over and over again. And they would continue encircling them, encircling them, until the leader fired the first arrow, which initiated the killing and the slaughter of the animals, and they would proceed to do so. Now, this takes a whole lot of skill. You're galloping, you've got you know one line of horses galloping this direction, another line galloping that direction, and so on and so on. At the same time, once that leader loosed that first arrow, everyone else begins firing arrows as well, and you've got to be careful not to hit your comrades. Um, so what you're doing here is you're learning to maneuver as a unit without trampling over each other 
in a heated and hostile situation where there's danger involved. You know, you could be running into each your danger to yourself because you guys could be crashing each other and trampling over each other. And uh, the animals on the inside are dangerous too, especially when you're actually fighting an army that doesn't want to be encircled and trampled. They want to fight back and get their way out of there. And you're also, you know, you're you're training your accuracy for your you know your shots. You want to make every shot count. You want to make sure you put the animal down with one shot, and you also want to make sure not to hit your fellow soldiers or hunting buddies in this case, in this scenario, while doing so. Now, the approach for warfare was kept very similar when the Mongols began fighting people, of course. And uh, there was very little difference in the way they approached their warfare as well. The big difference being they also had a troop of heavy cavalry. And this is something that, again, I believe people often overlook. When they picture the Mongol, I don't want you to picture the Mongol army, let's say, is 100,000. I don't want you to picture 100,000 of all of them clad in iron lamellar. They, they didn't all wear iron lamellar because they couldn't, not everyone, like I said, could afford that kind of armor. The elite bodyguard of the Khan, I believe, yes, I believe every last one of them had the best equipment and the best tools because they were getting the best pay. When the Mongol army went on campaign, the soldiers did not expect pay. He got to keep any booty or plunder that he found, aside from what he gave to the Khan as a donation, which the Khan would then distribute among older soldiers or uh, who were either stricken by poverty or who were too injured to fight. Uh, basically, the good version of the VA. <laughs> the good version of the VA uh, for U.S. viewers. So, most of them would be wearing, you know, their leather boots, their silk shirt, uh, their cotton, and if they could afford it, their boiled scale armor. Which are leather, which is actually very effective at stopping, uh, stopping arrow fire. Uh, and it was probably at the same leather, but if you look up Mike Lowe's video, I'll probably put a little clip in of it. You can see how effective the armor is at stopping an arrow, and also how effective the armor with the silk shirt underneath it is at stopping an arrow as well. Now, as you go up to the higher class generals, you know they're going to be wearing your iron shackled armor or your steel shackled armor. Same thing. Uh, Frame out there saying steel and iron are different. I'm like, well, yeah, uh, steel is a composite. This steel you're talking about is a composite of carbon and iron, so there's still iron within it. Uh, they would also use the lance, and yet again, these are the elite troops who are going to be using the lance. So if we separate it, you had mostly soldiers wearing little or no armor with their bow as you know light cavalry, and uh, let's say that's about 80% of the army. Then you'd have your commanders and your elite soldiers and your heavy cavalry, which is going to be 10 to 20% of the army. Because remember, size would vary from time to time with the army. It's not always going to be exactly 10,000 men. It's not going to always be exactly 1,000 men in this group. I, I get, I'm pretty sure the tens and the hundreds were able to keep consistency because, you know, smaller numbers are easy to keep consistent. And, you know, Mongol soldiers died on the battlefield too. That happens. You know, Mongol soldiers also get killed on the field of battle. So your numbers are going to shrink as battle progresses until those troops are replaced. So the majority of them are going to be wearing that light armor with their bow as their primary weapon, you know. And then the heavy cavalry is going, they're the ones who are going to have the heavy lances, the heavy maces, the swords. And Mongols did not only have curved swords, they also had straight swords. Um, even though they were straight, though, they were usually primarily single-edged for their uh, cutting purposes, so they were still primarily a cutting tool. But that was, again, an elite separate contingent that did so. Now... When approaching the battlefield, you wouldn't just insert you would still try to encircle the enemy, but obviously you wouldn't be able to annihilate them all with arrows because you'd have some you'd have some heavily armored opponents as well. And you can't just pick them all apart with armor. I mean if your armor's covering all the vital parts of your body, well then there's it's it's no damage being done. The arrow can keep bouncing off your armor or just bouncing off your shield or sticking to your shield depending upon the arrow itself. So the idea would be to sweep down on the enemy, and remember, these are separated into units of tens, and hundreds, and thousands. So each of these guys had this man they grew up with for their entire life. Like I said, you know, they've been doing this since they were like four years old. If you're 34, you're on the battlefield, that's 30 years of experience, and 30 hunts at least that you either saw or you took part in. So you're very disciplined in what you're doing. So this is easy for you. This is, again, what made the Mongols extremely effective, their approach to warfare. It wasn't like it was a job like a soldier who's getting paid a specific amount to do something. It's his everyday life. The only difference is instead of hunting an animal, he's hunting a man on the battlefield. So they'd, be, they'd swing out against their enemy in these circles, pelting them with arrows, much like the uh, Scythians and the Parthians did to Crassus and his men. And when the enemy was worn down enough, 
then the heavy cavalry could come in and crush them while those archers continued to encircle them, encircle and rain an endless barrage of arrows down on their enemy. So, you know, the training was pretty simple from a Mongol perspective. It's everyday life. What they did every day was part of their training. And the only difference is now we're fighting an enemy. Now, I also want to point out, though, a weakness to the Mongols that a lot of people overlook was the amount of grasslands needed because as the Mongols move, their horses need food to survive. And one of the reasons a lot of historians don't believe some armies were the size they said they were because it wasn't impossible for the Mongols to have half a million horses but uh, therefore have half a thousand troops. Half a million horses, half a million troops. Well, no. If you have half a million troops in a Mongol army, you're going to have two and a half million horses because each soldier has his mount and he's going to have four extra ones behind him. So, you know, they're going to eat up a whole lot of grass in that process. The horses need a lot of food to survive and they need water as well and so on. So whenever the Mongols would approach an area that, you know, had less grasslands, they would usually halt their progression as far as, because they were still primary cal cavalry force for fighting. And, uh, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty much it for how the Mongols were trained. It was just basically everyday life. The hunt being one of the, the best situations with which they were able to train. And like I said, the only big difference between that and the battlefield would be that heavy cavalry, con heavy cavalry contingent of troops you'd have to smash and crush what was left of an enemy you had just worn down. And the funny thing about it is the Mongol approach to warfare was actually pretty simple and pretty well known. And people ask, well, if it was so simple, why was it so effective? I think what people overlook, again, is it's something simple, but they added a few things to it, just a little bit of tweaking to it that made it much more effective. Like I said earlier, the deception, making your forces look much, much bigger than they actually are, or uh, waiting for the right time to attack. The attitude of the enemies they were fighting also had a lot to do with it. When they were um, fighting the Chinese, one effective way the Mongols were able to annihilate them was, or defeat them rather easily, was that they promised uh, a lot of the peasants freedom if they would join them. And there were several cases where the uh, low class people would not only betray, but outright rebel against their Chinese overlords in hopes of freedom. So you, they, could, they would also, it wasn't just their battlefield tactics, it was also their strategy for warfare as well. They would turn these people against them. Like I said, Genghis Khan, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense for him to use this tactic because he himself was low on the totem pole of society in Mongolia. He was not someone you would expect to become a great Khan. It's what started the civil war between he and his brother because his blood brother was a noble class and well, Genghis was not on the same tier as he was. He wasn't, as they, as they say, on the totem pole. He wasn't as high as he was, so he shouldn't be equal with him. So I think, I do believe that's a tactic Genghis Khan would use extremely effectively because it was a position he himself was once in. So um, there we discussed a bit of the uh, Norman uh, training. Like I said, the way their way of life was very simple. And the weapons being used by the Normans, sorry, by the Mongols. I keep saying Normans and Mongols, get the words mixed up. By the Mongols uh, being their bow, their lance, their mace, and their swords. Straight ones and curved ones. And like I said... The armor worn by the uh, most of the troops is going to be extremely light, or in some cases, none at all. The uh, lasso is a weapon also used by the Mongol, and I know that's a bit of a controversial one, but I'm going to, you know, debunk what a lot of people complain about that in another video later. So stay tuned and look forward for that one. Thank you all for joining me. If you like the video, give it a like, share, make sure you subscribe so you can see part four when it releases. If you have any uh, other comments, any other questions, anything else you want me to cover or discuss, any other what-if scenarios where verses come up uh, between two great warrior clans or two great warriors that lived around the same time that didn't fight each other, uh, please leave those questions in the, in the comment section below. I'd be glad to learn about all of them and cover them. If you think I missed anything in the video, or you think I overlooked anything, you think I talked too fast, you know, any advice you can give me, I'm willing to take it and I'm willing to learn from it. Thank you all for watching the video. Have an excellent day.